you're you're going to have to spend a little bit of time revisiting that. I absolutely did, especially when I started working with Kubernetes, and which is all containers on the cloud. That was Alicia Moniz, who is one of the AI leaders in the kind of big data space right now. She specializes on the Microsoft cloud of Azure. And today we talk a lot about kind of future proofing your career, as well as some of the really cool technologies that are enabling our future to be powered by AI. So without further ado, here is Alicia Moniz. Well, Alicia, welcome to the Free the Data podcast. I'm happy to have you here. And you're based down in Tejas or Texas, where I was born, I, I take it. Is that right? Yeah, so it's uh, Houston, Texas, by way of Las Vegas. And I'm actually born and raised in Hawaii. Oh, wow. That's awesome. No, I love that. Um, my wife and I went to Kauai for the first time a couple of years back, pre-COVID and all that, and had had a good time there. Um, so beautiful, you know. Reminded us a lot of home. I live out here in San Diego, and so there's a lot of similarities, you know. Uh, that's awesome. So how long have you been down there in Texas? Uh, so I've been here maybe about three years now, mm -hmm. and uh, had a, a wonderful opportunity to, to work with Avanade on data and engineering projects. And um, Avanade is a joint venture between um, Accenture and Microsoft. And it really allowed me the, the room and the space to really focus on Microsoft technologies. And at a point in time in my career where, where you know, cloud was, was becoming even more um, acceptable to, to integrate into systems, um, and at a time where, you know, the West Coast was just exploding with AWS ad adoption, mm -hmm. Azure really became my my opportunity to upskill and provide value. Because, you know, as an IT contributor, that's really what you want to do is you want to be able to solve problems and, and help customers solve problems. And you want to bring something to the table and you really want to be valuable. So, um Truly grateful for the opportunity. Houston is also a, a fantastic place as far as um, diversity and perspective. Mm. So Houston is is a global city um, because there's so many oil and gas yeah. professionals here. There's people from all over the world. And people from different parts of the world solve problems differently. So it, it really contributed to my ability to, to speak to different audiences as well as to, to solve problems problems from different perspectives. So yeah, that's so cool. And so the heat in Houston is better or worse than the heat in Las Vegas? Uh, so it's a different type of heat. So right. Vegas is a very dry heat. Uh, the, the Houston's a, a wet, um, soggy heat <laughs> where, so um, I, I do have many friends who have a hard time um, like with their respiratory system here in mm. Houston, just because the humidity is so, so different here. Yeah. So but my skin looks great. So less <laughs> of moisture here. And uh, you, you, you got to pick your vices, right? That Arizona slash Las Vegas sun can be, be horrible for yeah. you if you're, you're out in it too long. Yeah, every time. So I'm from, uh, I, you know, I was born in Texas, not far from you, where you're at now. And then I was, was raised in Phoenix. And uh, I don't know how I just never went my life without lotion or anything. <laughs> but then now I live in San Diego where it's much more humid. I go back to mm -hmm. Arizona for three days and I am dying. I need to get back to the humidity. So I totally know uh, what you're talking about. But yeah, those summers can be uh, can be pretty hot and, and uh, overwhelming, I would say. So since you've moved there uh, and you've been working on this Azure stuff, you've actually been uh, a three-time Microsoft MVP. Is that right? Yes. So, uh, I, like I said, I'm, I'm relatively new to the cloud mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I, I found my family, my, my IT family in the Microsoft Pass community. So, um, yeah. that's their community for SQL server professionals. And, um, one of my very first experiences, I'll, I'll never forget it, was at the past summit that they hold annually in Seattle. And um, 
I, I don't know what the experience is for, for you as a male when you go to an IT conference, but as, as a female going to an IT conference, it can be overwhelming. Um, there's, there's not a lot of, of female representation at these events. And it's, it's sometimes when you express an interest or a topic, it's, it's taken in the wrong context, I guess, or the wrong mm. way. So at some point you, you kind of, don't feel as comfortable reaching out. And um, the the past community, what they did was they, they had a number of kind of events which helped to, to make me feel that it was a safe environment for me to, to ask questions and learn on a topic that totally intimidated me. So um, one of the first events I attended was the, the um, it was the first timers event. And um, through the networking sessions, I met one of the organizers. So um, shout out to Lari Carr for finding me that day. She she is my angel. She's my sequel sister and my my angel of um, as far as community advocacy. And she co-hosts three of the chapters uh, in in California, and she really got me involved and engaged. And that week, of course, I, I also attended their their women's luncheon, which is a great opportunity for me to network with, with other ladies who are interested. And I kind of left the event with a, with a cohort of friends who were kind of on the same learning journey as me. And, you know, from there, we challenged each other to to upskill and we challenged each other to, to get started on our first certification. And, you know, once those first couple of certifications were, were kind of knocked out, it, it really empowered me to, to tackle more certifications and start learning more about the stack. Uh, so I hold maybe about a dozen cloud certifications and I'm started in AWS, Azure, Databricks and and Apache Kafka, which is open source. But I, I never would have taken that first certification or, you know, taken that first step because it is so intimidating mm -hmm. if it hadn't have been for for my group of friends that I made at that first event. So um and you know, as the years have gone by, I've started wanting to get back and to contribute. So I, I started speaking and um speaking on AI topics. And um, as a data engineer, that was kind of my next body of knowledge that, that I wanted to conquer. Yeah. So um, a lot of research into cognitive services and um, people at work started noticing that I had this interest and they invited me to participate on, on these projects with these new technologies. And um, Pretty soon at work, I'm known as a subject matter expert on AI. So, That's you know, cool. I, I really encourage people to, to get involved and to, to leverage your community to, to explore these bodies of knowledge that you're curious about and have a passion about, but don't have the practice to practical experience, practical or work experience so that you can go ahead and get that experience under your belt. Yeah, that's fascinating. Let's let's rewind to that. So when was that past event that you went to that was so kind of life changing for you? I, I want to say it was the spring of 2019. Mm. So it's been a couple of years. It's not been too long. like not it's, it hasn't been that long at all. And um, I with the speed that things change in technology, it's. It's just been, um, it, it's it's kind of been a sprint towards, you know, on-prem to, to Azure, like literally yeah. for me. <laughs> so so that, that's so cool. So at the PASS Summit, the Professional Association for SQL Server, I think, is that what it stands for? It's a SQL Server professional. I, I, I mm -hmm. used to go to that uh, many moons ago. Um and and there you you went to a women's luncheon and you met you met some friends and you met some organizers and you guys have kept in touch it sounds like yeah yeah i well i i always well maybe it's a me thing but i i always make lifelong friends it's mm. you know once you connect with people who have the same work ethic as you or the same um, you make that comment connection as far as either the same passion or the same background or, you know, once you 
you form that connection, it's it's really, um, you know, now I'm responsible for for mm. that little bit of happiness, right? And happy to, to yeah. connect. And so that the opportunity there because of how past structured it allowed you to find these people. And through that, I mean, it sounds like things have really, uh, really progressed for you in this space. And, and so going into that, going into that past conference where you met all these people and things changed, what was your experience prior to that with, uh, data engineering, you know, the cloud, all the stuff like, had you, uh, cause I know you went to school yeah. in Las Vegas. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so I'm, I'm not saying that it, it was only this, uh, it definitely was a catalyst. So mm-hmm. I, I do have a bachelor's degree in computer science. I have a master's degree in computer science as well as an MBA. So I had had, um, maybe three to four years under my belt as a, programmer. So that was C++. And that started with, you know, formal education and then um, transitioned into um, report development and ETL um, for um, four to five years. And that was kind of overlapped with, um, I I did start in level two support for a software as a service uh, Mm -hmm. analytics platform. So there was practical um, experience in there as well. So it's, it wasn't starting from zero. It yeah, was, you knew your stuff. And, yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I, I am a little older too. So, <laughs> um, you know, so it, it wasn't like I was straight out of school and showed right, up at these right, places right, right. and, you know, all of a sudden, bam, it's really, I think that, you know, as, as data engineers and, um, uh, and I, I think deep in my soul, I'm still that DBA. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, we look at opportunities to provide um, more value and more insights to to our our data. And sometimes it's a little hard when what we're doing is we're we're talking to the data all day long versus talking to the people. So I think my journey has been more about talking to the people in addition to the data. Yeah. And and so... For anyone a little bit unfamiliar here, the work you're talking about is really back end focused mostly. Would you, yes. would you agree? Yeah. So versus, yes. you know, some of some of the other people I've had on the show are very focused on the data visualization side, the actual front end of like what people see. And that's very I think people that have never that you could know nothing about data and I can show you a chart and talk to you about it and and you'll get it. Talking about say uh, a replication across the cluster or high availability are things that are just not natural to us, right? So, so as you've progressed in this space, you become sort of this this AI, uh, you know, a resource, a subject matter expert here. Um, that in the journey was all started there with the past stuff. Talk to me about. Uh, you know, so like, what do you see as the key technologies, maybe someone that is a DBA today, that is on the back end, just making sure things are up and running, keeping the lights on, as we used to say, uh, what kind of technologies or things do you think would be worth exploring? I mean, there's a lot of them. So, so any, any mm-hmm. tips on like, oh, I would do that, I would do this, or is it quite more of a shotgun approach? What would you say? Yeah, so there's definitely um, a very you can look at it very systematically if you're an on-prem DBA or on-prem data engineer and you're looking at, well, well, how do I expand my tool set or how do I expand my skill set? And um, you can either look at building your, your skill set out to include some of these, these AI scripting languages and um, because people who sit closest to the data are, they're going to be the first people that get asked, "Hey, we're thinking about this new project. Um, we're think it's it's going to be either Python or it's going to be R. Um, we we know that you're the most com- comfortable with the data. Um, you you maintain the data systems. Is this something you'd be comfortable doing?" So I, I think if you're looking at future-proofing a career or looking at um, moving into to AI or machine learning, then I, I think go for it. Pick a language, Python or R, and there, there's multiple documents out there to dispute, you know, which is better. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, if you've 
majored in computer science, you've you've probably used MATLAB or some similar tool. Um, R is going to be a little bit more familiar. If you've done programming in C++ or C Sharp, then Python is going to be a, a little bit more familiar for you. So um, I use Python, just yeah. saying. Right. <laughs> uh, so, you know, go ahead and, and do some preliminary just so that you can have a conversation about it and see if you're interested about it. And any of the tools, any of the cloud tools are going to interoperate with either Python or R. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. if you're looking at, and that's for the programmatic pieces, I think if you're more on the system administrator side where that's where your interest is, interests are as a DBA, then um, everything in the cloud is networking. You're, you're going to have to spend a little bit of time revisiting that. I absolutely did, especially when I started working with Kubernetes, and which mm -hmm. is all containers in the cloud. So um, I think pick a stack. So this might take you a little bit as far as, you know, do I want to invest the time in AWS or Azure? But um, if you're working on uh, Microsoft technologies and you're a SQL Server DBA, then absolutely spend the time on Azure. Microsoft Learn has some some great kind of um, learning modules that they tag to their certifications. And um, it's a great way to get through the concepts. I think everybody should know at least one cloud technology and, mm -hmm. and at least at the vocabulary level. I think that in the future, when people have conversations about, about storage on the cloud, um, whether it's S3 or Azure Data Lake Storage, um, I think just your ability to contribute to those conversations and, and part of contributing is, is knowing the vocabulary when they say these things. Mm -hmm. um, if you can follow along in AWS, then you'll probably be able to follow along conceptually with the Azure conversations and likewise. But um, uh, yeah, yeah AZ-900. Different, different couple words there, right? Because, and I think that's so important. Um, yeah, obviously everything is in the cloud now, or if, if you're not, you probably work at the government, but otherwise everyone else <laughs> is doing something in the, in, in the cloud. And the the vocabulary is key. So so I would love for you to to break down some of that for me because I can't tell you how many times I've been in a meeting and some big product expert is out there saying I need to hire a uh, Java engineer for his JavaScript application. And I'm looking, I'm shaking my head going, these are not the same thing. So words matter, right? Little mm -hmm. tiny differences that may seem the same make a big difference. So what you could just give me some, I don't know, top five things that I should know for Azure specifically, like some vocab out yeah. there to help me understand yeah. what it is. Well, well, so if you're a data engineer, there's probably like five tools that you use, right? So you have um, some type of database, you have some type of ETL, and you have some type of, of automated scripting. So if you are looking at future proofing kind of your career, then what you should do is you should sit down and you should map your current set of tools to the set of the, the matching corresponding set of tools in both Azure and AWS. And then that way you can see if this job was to change and move to Azure, then what would it what would it look like? And you know, with Azure, it's it's really easy with SQL Server because you have Azure SQL, you have Azure um, managed instances. So the the learning differential, like it's not that big of a lift. Yeah. So so how big of a lift do you want to make things for yourself? Because if you are working with SQL Server and you know you, you go over to AWS and SQL Server may or may not be there, and now you're you're having to to use their database technologies, then um, that's you know you're going to have to go through your whole certification process all over the place. And but but maybe that's what will differentiate you, you mm -hmm. know, so you can look at it that way. 
Do you, you've been doing this for a few years now, especially focused on the Azure stuff and all that, but like you mentioned, a big, you know, a, a long history of, of knowing computers inside and out, we'll say, or knowing tech. Um, do you, I mean, I've had this because I, I've kind of been in that boat where I've done a lot of different technologies throughout my career. D does it matter to you anymore? Like if a client came to you, and I know you have a full-time job and you do that, but let's say you were out there as a consultant, a client came to you and said, hey, I'm using uh, Blueberry, it's a new cloud data platform. Would you, would you be like, fine, I don't care. Like, I like, trust me, I'll figure it out because I've had so much experience in it. Or do you find that they're so different that no, 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 I need to really learn this one, you know, or like in the end, cause databases are kind of this way, right? Like if you know yeah. SQL really well, yeah, I may not know Oracle PL SQL, but I can query the thing, right? Just like yeah. I could query my my SQL or whatever else. Like, are there some common truths amongst us that you yourself have developed of like, so, you, so it's, you're kind of agnostic, like, yeah, hit me with it and, and I'll figure it out. Yeah. Or is it still very different? I, I am very agnostic. So uh, the Confluent Kafka platform is open source. It, yeah. it was a, a total, you know, I had to relearn things that, you know, I, I, I probably last time I touched those things was, um, not, not even like five, 10, zero, 10 years ago. I want to say maybe like even back to college, just because I've been so focused on Microsoft technologies for this long. So, um, I, I want to say that, um, there are things and, and, and again, I, I am a little older. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to say that there are things that, that you bring with you that, you know, cannot be taught. You know, um, it doesn't matter how big your server is if you have a poorly running query. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. so when you're looking at summarizing data or batch loading or, you know, what data needs to be delivered in what frequency to provide the best value to my business. Um, these are really things that you carry with you throughout systems and it's really maintaining that clarity and that focus on delivering value and and not getting tied up in the technology and so that's really why people who ask for help when when they start new projects or when they learn new technologies these people are going to run so much faster because they're mm -hmm. not getting caught up on I knowing every single command on, on, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in certifications because it helps with my, my learning path, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not the driver be between or behind me getting the certifications. It's, it's really, you know, what value is that technology going to bring to my project and to my customer? So, um, I, I think if you have an opportunity to, to learn a new technology, um, go for it, you know, yeah. go for it, um, ex accept the responsibility and uh, ask for help as you go and good luck to you. Yeah. And so you mentioned Confluent and Kafka because this is, and, and this I think is a really interesting one because, um, well, is there a Microsoft equivalent of this? I know, a AWS has like their own hosted version. Is there a Microsoft equivalent of Kafka or do you just run Kafka as is on Azure? So you definitely can run Kafka as is on Azure. You can do that IaaS and then Confluent runs on Azure as well. Mm -hmm. And then there's Event Hubs, which is uh, Kafka compatible. Yeah, okay. And so talk to me about what is different about, I'll, I'll say Kafka, but you know, Pla uh, this type of platform because it's different than if I right now I'm a DBA or uh, a data engineer and I do ETL jobs and I have a myriad of databases or data sources out there and I pull them into a data warehouse or a data lake or whatever we want to whatever uh, w noun we want to use what w what is different in the Kafka world than how I currently do things yeah so it, it really goes back to to how do we look at at data you know, and how do we look at how we're handling data? And I, I think when we first started 
things off. I, I think a lot of us DBAs are used to transactional systems where data goes from one system to another. And, you know, in transactional systems, you, you start somewhere and the data is in a consistent state from left to right. You know, so it's it's very, um, it, it goes from point A to point B to point C, and then it's saved in point D. And with, with Kafka, it's really that decoupling of data from where it sits. So the system at the underlying uh, kind of storage layer, um, what it does is it replicates the data to multiple sources. And because the data is stored differently, it can be accessed that much quicker. And this decoupling lets you also decouple at the programmatic level because you're not writing data to one location. Um, you can have multiple consumers and that, that kind of separation of producer to consumer for the data changes the way you handle the data. So mm -hmm. when you're looking at a kind of like a bigger architectural design pattern, what you're looking at is, um, and this is where we see a lot of the, the cloud technologies coming into play. And then you have new database systems um, like Cosmos DB, where what they're doing is it's a cluster type of a storage and you're, you're not having writes that occur one at a time that mm. harden. Um, you're having multiple writes occurring and you're having multiple reads occurring. And there's different consistencies to the data depending on when the events happen. So, you know, technology wise, this is another kind of uh, type of a data store that's handling data differently. What Kafka does a lot differently is it's it's not just a store it's a stream so what you're looking at is how are you sending multiple streams of data and when you're looking at building systems that go from on-prem to the cloud to multiple clouds what you're looking at is you need a technology that not only talks to to one cloud it needs to talk to multiple clouds and but have the same guarantees for consistency so whether you're a, a Microsoft cloud architect or an AWS cloud architect, um, this is one of those tools where, you know, Kafka Confluent is going to come up in the conversation and it's okay if you don't know what it does, but um, you, you, you probably should add it to your learning path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I think that this was a, a lesson that I learned a long time ago. And I think um, it's important if anyone's going down this path, uh, I assume you read Jay Krepp's uh, blog called uh, the, the Log, I think it is. It was kind of the original one when he created Kafka of like, here's the concept and here's why this works. But it really blew my mind. And since implementing it at several companies, I, I was, I've just been in love with how it works. But it doesn't replace everything, right? Is, is it oh, still... You know that. Sorry, I didn't know you knew. I was all like, you know, you don't want to get people kind of mixed, like super in the weeds and yeah. whatnot. So... So, so you tell me then, um, what were some of the things that you were surprised about with that? Well, the things that, that Kafka I found to offer is just the speed, right? Getting the data mm -hmm. quicker, which is great. And then being able to have a way to replay history because in the log, mm -hmm. it'll store these events. So one of the things that when when we were setting it up, um, you know, at, at, at a client of mine back in the day, it was it, it was your ability to you know as the data in the show the free the data because the concept is like these events occur and they get sent to Kafka to a topic to a stream and then later on you build a new product that needs that data and it needs to replay history. You can go find history. You can go see what happened and I don't have to go hunt twelve different databases because. It, it, it is in the topic, right? Like the log is the source of truth. And in my history in data world, that was always the hard thing. Like everyone always, you know, or at least for a long time, it was data warehousing, business intelligence. The whole idea is one source of the truth. And yeah. 
it's almost impossible. It really is. And especially changes, right? Yeah. The true changes, right? <laughs> so so that's really what streaming unlocks is, you know, multiple yeah. versions of the truth. And well, uh the thing that different formats of the data too, because now you're looking at data in, in different forms. So flat yeah. files, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's not just uh, database records from one database to another. If that's all you're dealing with, life is very easy for you. <laughs> but unfortunately... Yeah. It's, uh, it's barcode everything and put all data into a table, right? Yeah, yeah. Life is easy if, if all you're dealing with are database tables you can run basic SQL against. It, it's, but that's not the world we live in today, right? App development where data would arrive late, you know, because uh, uh, you have someone, for example just went on a road trip with my family. We downloaded Disney movies. Um, these are playing offline because we're in the middle of the desert on, 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 in a car. When I get back connected, it's going to re-upload where I left off in my movie watching to the Disney, to my profile on the Disney, in Disney's app. Well, that data is, it wasn't there for a period of time. So what do you do? Right. And this is where I think these newer technologies. So if you're working in or looking to get into this, I mean, would you agree that you're not going to have like in college, you may say, hey, here's here's a trans here's a OLTP, a transactional database. Here's a, a data warehouse. That's all you need to know. I feel like that's not true. Well, right. <laughs> I, I, I think, um, you know, everything's really additive at this point, you know, and um, I, I think we. DBAs, we are uh, we are a little risk adverse, right? Because you, you want people, responsible people handling your data, right? Uh, so, you know, no code changes on Friday afternoons. Yeah. So, you know, when you're looking at, you know, what do I need to learn? Because everything is changing. I, I think if there's one thing as a data professional that that you should learn, it's, it's probably going to be Kafka. And it's because infrastructure wise, I, it's not going to be a one cloud solution that we, we land in. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the organizationally, your organization can, can settle on one cloud and then you'll have marketing go out and they have a budget and their, their vendor will only work in the other cloud. And, mm -hmm. you know, the marketing CMO is very enthusiastic. So you know what? We're all going to end up in multi-cloud situations. And um, it it doesn't have to be a, a either or. A lot of the times it's going to be a blend. Um, I, I don't see um, a, a replacement. When you look at people who are adopting the cloud, it's there's so much that's that's still it's like it's definitely a process you know it's not a overnight process right um you you have to have a strategy about it and then better yet if if you can modernize while you're my instead of just doing a, a lift and shift then then definitely you want to take the time and what kafka really helps people do is it helps with um kind of that enablement and access to multiple streams of data. So I, I think the story that is not talked about enough is, you know, if your organization has Kafka data sitting on-prem, then that's data that can already almost overnight be sent to the cloud, either on right. Azure and AWS. And then once it's landed in the cloud, you can go ahead and have ex e very easy access and exposure to either Azure native or AWS native services. So if you've been looking to, to get started with AI solutions in Azure or get started with machine learning in AWS and you just don't have the data because all your systems are still on-prem, but they're on-prem and they're talking to Kafka, you yeah. can go ahead and set up a separate pipe and go ahead and send that data to the cloud. And now your your development teams are enabled because they have that data to kickstart their development. So, um, and definitely for your advanced analytics and machine learning projects. So if your data is kind of the lifeblood of de decision-making, right? Mm -hmm. So you hope so. You, 
You have, <laughs> I, I don't know about on Friday nights, right? But, um, you know, for, for the rest of the week, we make decisions by data. And, uh, but, you know, what's really exciting is, you know, in these new sources of data. So we have IoT devices, we have mm-hmm. manufacturing devices, and we have, we have just tons and tons of data that we've been collecting, but we haven't been able to to leverage or build value off of. And um, I, I think that it's amazing for us to, to use a technology to, and I'm all about data democracy, right? So mm-hmm. provide access to data to, to more, more anal- analytics and more, yeah. you know, machine learning. Um, but, um, y- you know, but then comes responsibility, right? Yeah. So, so- that's the flip side. It, would you say then that with something like Kafka, it allows you to tie your on-prem and cloud solutions together? Yeah. Because- oh, d- oh, definitely. It's it's definitely a, a technology that's going to be able to give you a, a bridge and that piping. Mm-hmm. Um, there's different tools and uh I guess if you're if you're a programmer, so so I have to back up because Kafka is definitely a programmer's tool. Yeah. And um, as a consistent DBA, I, I found that very interesting because, uh, you know, fundamentally Kafka is going to be schema-less. Mm-hmm. So you can go ahead and dictate um, schema policies, but this is schema and read and not schema and write. So when you look at the difference between a transactional database system and, a, and what Kafka does, is it, it kind of sort of lets developers send data in any format that they want. Yep. Like, and um, as a DBA, the, there is a little bit of concern, but... Gives you, you know, some hard palpitations. Oh, oh, yeah, I'm <laughs> clenching as we speak. Like, you can you can feel the fear. But, um, you know, Confluent does provide tools where, where you can do some schema... Uh, control there but um but but think of how that empowers your developers right you know think think of all the challenges that they have either writing to a database or reading from a database um because their their data set is malformed when they're trying to perform either the insert or the uh, or the update or Mm -hmm. the merge and um developers love kafka they they love working with that system, and when you when you think about why analytics systems break, they break because of schema. Mm-hmm. You can't load the data because it, you're expecting it in a different form. How many times, as an SSIS developer or an ETL developer, you've had a package fail? because the data is expected in a specific format. Yeah, right. Super and common. And we look at, right? And we look at all the devices. So IoT devices, if you if you have a manufacturing floor with two to 5,000 devices and you're streaming data and how many different manufacturers are, are sending data along that pipe? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and how many different formats are they are they sending data in? And how many different languages if you're an uh, international manufacturing floor? So when you're looking at from a, a, a data democracy type of a situation, it's you're looking at a capabilities to absorb data from schema-less slash undefined data sources for, for massaging, and like eventually it's probably going to end up in a transactional database sure. system down the road yeah. you know and and even probably excel right yes. like your executive oh, your executive is going to That's me is and powerpoint <laughs> yeah this is right you they're going to want to report on their success it's going to end up in excel and, and powerpoint yep. you know yep. but um that that ability to to respond quickly and and just the rate that things are changing and um many of the cloud services are building out connectors to to different things but there's way more sources than there can be connectors built Mm -hmm. um at at the rate things are changing and that's absolutely 
one of the things that Kafka has for it is their array of connectors and and not only that but the community so yeah, it's, it's not big. just the community helps contribute to that knowledge base as well and it's just amazing so tell me about you mentioned confluent a couple times uh what is the relationship between uh, apache kafka which is an open source project top level project for apache and confluent yeah so um confluent was uh founded by the creators of kafka and if you if you kind of look at Capabilities wise, uh, a lot of the functionality is is going to be the same. Uh, the the team maintains the the Kafka community. They run the Kafka Summit, and um, more of the administrative features are going to be available in the Confluent product. Now, the Confluent product also um, is available for. Uh, in, install through like the marketplace on on Azure, AWS, mm -hmm. and GCP. So uh, those integrations are it's kind of software as a service. So if you right. don't want to do the work with installing a connector on your your own servers and maintaining throughput for your production deploys or uh, code base, then that's a a way to go, and um, as well as if you're wanting to get started, you know, you can download and you can sign up for a free trial and get started in a couple hours and have data running through. Um, now you can also do the private linking. So if you'd like that service to run on your own dedicated cluster, mm -hmm. um, you can go ahead and do that. Yeah, that's amazing. So, so Confluent is sort of the commercial end, right? Like I remember yes. doing Hadoop work and we had Cloudera and Hortonworks and those were, you know, uh, you can, you can just download Hadoop, but no one does. You just get Hortonworks or Cloudera or whatever other provider, just like mm -hmm. Spark. You don't really do, some people do actual Apache Spark. Most people do Databricks or some other yeah. variant, right? So that way, if you're an organization, would you say something like Confluent is, is worth checking out because of how quickly you can get up and running? That I, I think it, um, so, so yes, and in any cloud, right? So you can go AWS, GCP, mm -hmm. or Azure. And um, it's, you, you'll, and your Azure team will or your AWS team, your cloud team will, mm -hmm. will help you get integrated to yeah. your data sources. Easy way for them to get up and running with Kafka, essentially, because Confluent is yeah. Kafka, just just their own version of it, I guess. Uh, and so tell me, you know, one thing, we talk about AI a lot. So is Kafka, or we'll say streaming more generally, I assume there's other ones out there besides Kafka, but it's the only one I'm familiar with. Is is Kafka the thing that powers our AI future? I mean, like, can you do it without that? Or is it like, no, you definitely want some type of streaming service? Uh, so I, I, I want to say what streaming enables us to do is to capture event level data. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you need event level data to do event level AI. There you go. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at, right? Because I think a lot of times people think of AI and it's such a broad term and it goes back uh, forever. But I think what most of us think of it is our smart speakers or our phones where we can ask it a question or something that knows me a little bit, right? And it knows my preferences. It knows that, you know, when I say do this, it knows yeah. the context of what I'm talking about because it's kind of thinking, right? It kind of gets familiar like a friend would, like a person yeah. would. Um, so, um, and that's all event based, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, that's why um, without those events, you can't do that. So you need something like this. Is that fair? Yeah, but I, I think that's for um, uh, some personalization, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, so if you're doing reactive uh, AI uh, at, at that speed, then you'd have to make decisions at that speed. So right. the data would have to be de delivered and then a decision be sent back. Uh, otherwise, we're talking about speedily. sort of hitchhiker and the hitchhiker's gal uh, guide to the galaxy, right? Where it's like we ask it a question and then it comes back later with the answer, 
right? Yeah. That, that's and the, hey, we had a bunch of data flow in. We're going to run some algorithms on it, different, you know, model, yeah. whatever. And, and then spit back an answer tomorrow. For the day. And yeah. I can give it to you at, at a daily level. You right, know? But, right. Um, but I feel like we're not there. Like everyone, and especially, you know, do you see this with, with, with your company or clients of how we people perceive consumer technology they want that in enterprise technology as well because what we're talking about is really enterprise stuff here right like a person's yeah. not going to buy this well, like do you see I, that influence i i think at, at an enterprise level it's there there's going to be a lot for accessibility mm -hmm. and um that includes so there, there's a ton of of things going on in the language space mm -hmm. so um given yeah that our, our work environments have changed, our teams have changed, we, we work in uh, multiple locations. Um, so, so how do we help our employees more, but kind of um, in, in a more distributed way? Mm -hmm. So um, translation services is huge. So say I, I gave an employee training and I was able to translate that to, to 20 different languages by the end of the presentation. It was just automatically repackaged and I'm mm -hmm. able to share that out with employees. Um, transcription services. Um, and then visually, we see a lot with with training our employees, right? Mm -hmm. So we saw this a lot with the, the oil companies and and not being able to to do a lot of the traveling. It's it's how do you deliver products and, and give a customer a, a customer overview without flying down there and physically being with them. Right. Yeah. So and then that's a, a tie in with the the visual and the digital twins. Yeah, that's fascinating. It is really kind of amazing in some of these, how these, uh, how we're able to do that nowadays is 3D modeling and, you know, uh, virtual reality type things. Do you uh -huh. see much going on in this space uh, with the whole metaverse thing? I mean, how do you feel about that? Um, well, well, definitely in the training segment. And mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, oil and gas, they have uh, the, the oil rigs that yeah. are, you know, hundreds of miles away. And um safety is huge with the oil and gas industry. So they can give safety trainings and they can drill down. And again, that's, that's accessing data systems um, and drilling through giving visual cues from, from the headsets, right? So uh, say you want a, a user manual for, for different objects. Mm -hmm on the ship so that's a tie-in between um visual ai yeah. and the digital twins where you're you're accessing information subsystems with visual triggers one of my favorite things like this and it's uh, not nearly as as uh, extreme is just the ability now to see what furniture looks like in your house have yeah. you done this oh, no, that, that's that's amazing <laughs> yeah you, you're you like let me see what that personal, couch looks like yeah personal time and money so so again that that really goes back and forth between kind of you know consumer needs versus versus enterprise needs yeah. right yeah but yeah that that's that's amazing you know how much personal time you you save and <laughs> and money with repainting walls and yeah. if, if I could flip through an app and, uh, well, they probably have these things where you can try on all the outfits in your closet before yeah. putting the one on, right? And you can use day. some recommendation system that says, hey, I don't know fashion. Just here's all my clothes. Make me look good. Click. And <laughs> there yeah. we go. Dr wear these things and, and, and people will, uh, will think you're, you're fashionable. That's what, that's really what, that was the whole point of this interview. I wanted to learn how to be more fashionable. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I think black t-shirt sells all, all there you, go. you know, style <laughs> challenges. So you, you've got it. Awesome. Well, Alicia, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really happy that we had this conversation and I, I know people listening had a lot to learn or learned a lot from, from you and all your insights here. I wish you all the best with everything you, you have going on. Where can people find you and connect with you and whatever else? Uh, they may want to do. 
Yeah. So um, you can always reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn. And mm-hmm. that's just Alicia Moniz. And um, I'm I'm happy to, to see everybody out and about. Okay. And hopefully we'll be able to do that more um, in the future. But who knows at this point? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. I had a wonderful time and uh, thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. I hope you enjoyed the interview there with Alicia Moniz. Stay tuned for lots more to come like that. Thanks for watching and I'll see you back here in the next one.